So I mentioned that I'd be covering the SI5351 from a MicroPython perspective a few videos back. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, do a video uh, that goes through the FI, SI5351. Uh, and, and in this video, I'll be covering, so what is, what is the SI5351 uh, and why is it attractive uh, uh, to as a local oscillator? I'll be providing some internal architecture details and then I'll uh, go through some programming uh, specifically with MicroPython and the Pi board uh, on how to produce quadrature LO output. So what is the SI5351? So I've included a link to the datasheet uh, down below, but it's an I2C configurable clock generator that can generate uh, many frequencies up to uh, 200 megahertz. So just panning down to the, uh, I've actually got it set up on a circuit here with the, with the Pi board. And here is the SI3 50, SI5351 development board from Adafruit. Now the SI5351 itself is this I see right here. So what makes it attractive? Well, basically from a homebrew perspective, there are a pile of freely available libraries to use. Uh, both for the Arduino, uh, CircuitPython, MicroPython, and so on and so forth. Um, and the frequencies cover, uh, the, the SI5351 outputs, cover pretty much all of the uh, HF band, uh, all the way from 40 meters uh, on up. Now, you do have some challenges uh, doing 80 meters. I know some uh, experimenters have, uh, have been able to achieve that. Uh, but, but there are some challenges uh, below uh, the 80 meter band uh, with the SI5351. So the other thing that, uh, that is uh, very useful with the SI5351, and it kind of differentiates it from, a, let's say, an SI570, is as you can see here, you can output the two clocks in quadrature or 90 degrees out of phase. And having a uh, synthesizer that allows you to do that um, not greatly, but it does simplify the, uh, the, the, the circuitry involved in, uh, in building an IQ style radio. Now you can generate quadrature output with a, fair, a pair of D-type flip-flops, so it's, uh, you know, it's uh, pretty easy to do, but it does simplify generally the, uh, the circuit that you have. So let's talk about now just a, a simplified internal architecture of the SI5351. And so let me just pan back here and uh, get my uh, get my internal architecture diagram out here. Bear with me, just panning down here. So here's the uh, an internal architecture view of the uh, SI5351A, uh, which is in a 10 MSOP package, and that's the version that's on the uh, the Adafruit uh, breakout board there. So the Adafruit version uh, basically has a, uh, an external uh, 25 megahertz uh, uh, crystal. Um, and, and then the, uh, the VDDO, which is the sort of the, the, the buffered output level for the, for the clocks is set at 3.3 uh, volts. Uh, although for the, from the, uh, the SI5351 board, it can take anywhere between three to five volts uh, as input. So in the internal architecture, there's, it's broken up into two, two, sort of two broad sections. There are the two PLLs, PLLA, PLLB, and then you have the three separately controllable clock outputs for clock zero, clock one, and clock two. And these are truly independent, so you can have completely different frequencies for clock zero, clock one, and clock two. So be, be, before we go into the programming, uh, let's sort of walk through uh, exactly how you program these separate stages and uh, what, what are some of the approaches to doing that. So here's a very simplified block diagram of how you control the output frequency. So you start with your uh, external crystal frequency here and that on the Adafruit broads is 25 megahertz. Um, the QCX radio uses a 27 megahertz external crystal. Uh, crystal. But it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So you basically start with this uh, external clock frequency. You multiply that by the, the PLL multiplier parameters that you, you, that you program through I2C. And that gives you the PLL frequency. So an example would, here would be, I'd start with my 25 megahertz external crystal. If my PLL multiplier was 10, 
that would result in a PLL frequency of 250 megahertz. So now that I have the PLL frequency of 250 megahertz, the final step is to divide that, uh, to, that 250 megahertz with the clock multiplier to give me my final output frequency. And so, for example, 250 megahertz, if I set this to 5, I would get an output frequency of 50 megahertz. So you can see there's two basic ways of approaching the problem of developing an output frequency. The first is to vary the PLL frequency between the, the correct parameters, so that's between 600 and 900 megahertz. And then you have a fixed clock multiplier which, which gives you your output frequency. So you can either vary the PLL and fix the multiplier, the clock multiplier, or fix the PLL frequency to a given frequency within that 600 and 900 megahertz, and vary the clock multiplier output. So for quadrature radios, because the way we set the phase is dependent on having this fixed, this is the approach that's generally used. Vary the PLL and fix the clock. And I've got an example at 7 megahertz uh, coming right up. So let's do a real example uh, with a real frequency in the, uh, seven, in the 40 meter band, 7.01 megahertz. So my desired output frequency is 7.01 megahertz. So in order to, uh, so, so the first step is that I want my PLL frequency to be a multiple, an integer multiple of that uh, 7.01 megahertz. So the easiest multiple that gets it within the range of 600 to 900 megahertz, which is kind of the limits of this, of this PLL here, is 100. So, uh, so in other words, I want to take this 7.01 megahertz, multiply it by 100, that gives me 701 megahertz, and that's my desired PLL frequency. Now, in order to figure out what the PLL multiplier is, I need to take the PLL frequency that I desire, 701 megahertz, and divide that by the crystal oscillator frequency. So in this case, I've got 701 megahertz divided by 25 megahertz, and that gives me 28.04. So doing the math the other way around, I've got 25 megahertz as my crystal frequency multiplied by 28.04, gives me my desired PLL frequency of 701 megahertz. Now, the SI5351, the way you set these parameters, is it's all with integer math. And this multiplier is expressed in the form of A plus B divided by C where A is an integer, B is an integer, C is an integer, but this number uh, cannot be greater than around about 4 million. So what we do is we'll pick a number less than 4 million, but that, that gives us enough resolution. So 28.04 expressed as A plus B divided by C is simply 28, and the 0.04 is 40,000 divided by a million. So that gives me my 700 and one megahertz PLL frequency. So the next step is to figure out a multiplier that takes this 701 megahertz PLL frequency and gets me to my desired 7.01 megahertz frequency, and that's our clock divider. And of course that happens to be 100 because that's what we chose in the first place. So this is the full path from deriving the PLL multiplier getting the PLL frequency, then finally the clock divider of 100 gives my clock output of 7.01 megahertz. So let's have a look at some code, and this is part of the SI5351.py that I've got up on the, the GitHub repository, which I'll include a link to below. Now, I, I didn't create this code. I actually took uh, the Adafruit uh, CircuitPython example and the, the Python, MicroPython um, dialect is, is pretty similar to, to that uh, which is available on the Pi board. So there's just a few differences in the way you, uh, where the libraries are for the I2C and the pins and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, this is the kind of section of code which is driving the frequency. And it, and it basically, you can see it's very straightforward here. Um, 
I take the, the input frequency here, which is, let's say, 7 megahertz. I derive the PLL frequency then from that by multiplying it by this multiplier, which is 100 in this case, although it can, kind of, it can be uh, pretty much any even integer um, so long as it meets the uh, demands of the SI5351 uh, PLL frequency limits, which is, I think, between around about 500 megahertz and 900 megahertz. It then, it then determines the multiplier by dividing the PLL frequency by the crystal frequency. Now, this crystal frequency obviously can vary. Uh, 25 megahertz is the published value of the crystal. The actual crystal frequency will be something different to that. And if you have a look at some of the toolkits, some of them include a correction value. Uh, and you'll see that uh, when I show the output that it isn't actually spot on. So it's a very stable VCO but it very much depends on what the actual crystal frequency is. And that'll vary from board to board. Um, so then anyway, uh, it divides the PLL frequency uh, by the crystal frequency to get the multiplier. It then works out uh, what is the uh, numerator and denominator and the integer part. So that's that integer part in this case would be 28. Um, the denominator is always is just set to a million to give me the maximum resolution. And then the numerator is that piece left over. So the 0 0.04, 28.04, uh, that is 40,000 out of a million. And then there are two simple calls here, PLL configure fractional, passing that integer part, 28, 40,000, a million. And then simply to, to get back to the clock, frequency, 7.01 megahertz, we simply take the PLL frequency and divide that by 100. So let's see some of this code in action. So here's the, uh, here's the code I've got here, some simple stuff to start with. I've got to uh, import pin from machine. Uh, I've got to import that SI5351 library. And then to set up the, uh, the synthesizer, I simply call the constructor on this and I pass the uh, pin that has the data pin and the clock pin. So I'm using a Pi board here. So let me just quickly pan over to the Pi board. Make sure you can see that in there. Yes, you can. So that's uh, Y9 and Y10 happen to be over here. Uh, and that's uh, SCL1, uh, sorry, SCL and SDA1 uh, on the Pi board. So here's the code. Let's cut and paste that into an active Pi board uh, REPL session that I've got going here. Uh, bear with me. I've just got to find the right one. Here it is here. So you can see there I pass those commands in there and I'm simply echoing out the, uh, the, the, the write and read instructions to the register here. So just for debugging purpose. And then to pan down over to the oscilloscope, you can actually see the output there. So this is the other thing that, uh, that, uh, that, that I, I needed to mention. The reason that you set, you vary the PLL and keep that multiplier between the output clock frequency and the PLL fixed is because that's the mechanism that you use to achieve uh, signals in quadrature. So if you have a look, that last command there, set phase, that set phase, you pass in the multiplier there and that multiplier is in units of the relationship between the PLL frequency and the final output frequency. Uh, and then, so 100 units would be a pi on four difference between, the, uh, between clock zero and clock two, and a pi on four is the 90 degree clock shift that we're after. So you can see there I've issued those two commands, uh, four, four megahertz on clock zero, four megahertz on clock two, and for those two clock signals to be in uh, 90 degrees out of phase with one another. And you can see over here, that's exactly what we're seeing on the oscilloscope. Now you can see there that it's, it's actually not exactly uh, 4 megahertz. There is a, uh, a difference of about 90 hertz, and that is to do with that uh, crystal uh, correction that, that you have to do. So anyway, uh, I thought this would be useful. Um, I have included in some previous videos uh, how you actually hook up your, uh, your uh, um, uh, either Pi board or Tiny Pico to the uh, SI5351. It's, it's very simple. You just select uh, SCL SDA pins 
uh, use the library that I have, have out there and uh, th th that's pretty much all you have to do. Now, some of the things, uh, you know, one of the things that I cover in, in the previous video is if you remember on, in the Tiny Pico radio, it would issue a loud click every time I changed frequencies. So one of the things, one of the tricks uh, that you've got to remember is there is a PLL reset command that you have to issue uh, every time you um, change the phase of the signals, but you don't issue it at any other point in time. Uh, if you issue a PLL reset command, you'll, you will generate that large click. Uh, so what you have to do um, is basically check to see if you have changed that multiplier. You only issue a PLL reset if you change the multiplier. And just uh, for interest sakes, um, this is like a, this is a quick debugging test. So as you saw in my old radio, um, I had the code in there to check to see if the multiplier had been changed. Uh, but basically it wasn't working and I couldn't for the life of me figure it, figure it out. I thought I was uh, mistakenly issuing PLL resets. I went through the entire library. It turned out that the code you're looking at has, in the, bu has the bug. So I'll just get at a high level, try and explain what this is and then I'll pause it. If you want to try and figure out what the bug is, uh, I'll tell you afterwards. So basically the, the top two commands set the frequency of clocks zero and, uh, zero and two, uh, both on PLLA. And then what I do is I say if the multiplier changes and just, just uh, going up there, you, you pick the multiplier by, you look at the frequency and then you have to figure out a multiplier which puts frequency times a multiplier in the range of the PLL the ability of the PLL. And as I said, that's between 600 and 900 megahertz. So with a frequency of seven megahertz, so you can see there, if the frequency is less than eight megahertz, then choose the multiplier of 100. So you only really need to change the multiplier if you're moving between bands. So you can see I've got those two lines setting the frequency on clock zero and clock two. And then I say, if the old multi only issue the set phase command and do the PLL reset, if the old multiplier uh, is not equal to the uh, to the current multiplier, and then right at the end, I I simply set uh, the old multiplier to be equal to the multiplier, so it so I don't keep reissuing the set phase command. But there's a bug in the code, so pause the screen if you if you're interested and see if you can find that bug. All right, so the bug is right here. And this is uh, a gotcha with Python that I'm a, I'm a C++ and Java programmer. I would never, this would never happen there, but it does happen here. I forgot to put an underscore underneath the old malt. So, uh, and I just missed that out. And of course, you know, Python, because you can declare variables at any point in the code, uh, so long as you're not uh, using them, uh, so long as you're not using them to, to, to add to or something like that, uh, it will just take that as a new variable. So that's what that was doing. Uh, I had it like this, it should have been like this. But anyway, I thought you might all find that interesting.